Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our webinar tonight, New National Paediatric Head Injury Guidelines. My name is Jenny Pearson. I'm the Education Officer for the Primary Health Network. With us tonight, I have Dr. Michelle Guppy, who will be answering any questions that you type into our chat box, which is great. And our presenter tonight is Dr. Liz Cottrell. Um, the, the webinar will be recorded and available on our website in our library with the slides and um, I will send you all the link over the next couple of days. I think that's all from me. Um, if you can all have your microphones on mute, that would be great. Um, and I'll just hand over to Michelle. Hello, everybody. Um... As Jenny said, my name's Michelle Guppy. I'm a GP in Armadale. Um, and look, I'd first like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're all meeting tonight and pay my respects to elders past, present and future and to welcome any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here tonight. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Liz Cottrell. Liz will be known to many of you who work up in the New England region, but I think there's a lot of you who, who won't know her. Um, Liz trained as an, a paediatric emergency specialist at Sydney Children's Hospital in Randwick um, and was a staff specialist there um, from 2002. And she moved to Armidale in 2010 to take up a position as a, a paediatrician at Armidale Hospital and also a position as Associate Professor of Paediatrics at the School of Rural Medicine at the University of New England. So Liz currently divides her time between um, working at Armadale Hospital and in the region um, and teaching paediatrics to our fourth year undergraduate medical students at the School of Rural Medicine. Um, and she's also involved in a number of research projects um, including paediatric pain management in rural emergency departments. I once heard Liz speak about um, a big study that was done on CT scanning in children and the increased incidence of, uh, of cancer in children. And it was a very interesting and engaging presentation. And it certainly made me change my practice after hearing Liz speak. So I'm really interested in hearing what she's got to say tonight um, about the new um, head injury guidelines, and I think it will be a really interesting talk. So, uh, handing over to you now, Liz. Thanks very much, Michelle. Okay, I hope I've got, I'm sharing my screen, I hope you can see it. Um, so, the talk today has really been prompted by the recent publication of, there you go. The recent publication of a guideline for which I have been a member of the steering committee and working group. So as Michelle said, my background is in paediatric emergency medicine. I did my subspecialty training as a paediatrician working in an emergency department. And as part of my role in that emergency department, I became involved in a research group that we decided to call PREDICT, which is Paediatric Research in Emergency Departments International Collaborative. And in that research group, we identified areas that we thought were worth worthy of further research because the, the, the answers to the clinical questions that we had weren't answerable by the current literature at the time. And PREDICT over the last 15 years has gone on to do major work in uh, bronchiolitis and most recently in head injury. So, for this presentation today, for me, it's about looking from the perspective of general practice when you're seeing children either who present with an acute head injury and making a decision about should I refer this child to the emergency department and also explain to the family of the reason why you might refer that child to the emergency department and what, their expect, what expectations there should be when the child is seen and assessed and whether or not they might require imaging of their brain, and what decisions and what processes are in place to ensure the child can be safely discharged from the emergency department. And also the flow on implications in general practices, follow up of children who have a head injury and symptoms of concussion who may be seen for follow up in general practice 
or sometimes in simple cases for mild head injury where there is a simple linear skull fracture, it may be appropriate for that child to be seen for follow-up in general practice. So the, there are many factors affecting decision-making in paediatric head injury. And a lot of it has to do with your own individual risk tolerance, but it also needs to take into account the fact that there are challenges in assessing young children, particularly infants, with head injury in the context of, you know, when you're seeing them, when the child's upset, if you can make a decision about whether or not there is a change in behaviour or not. So that is a challenge up front in many young children and infants after a head injury. And then considering what might, might be a minor head injury, what the likelihood of, of a serious underlying brain injury associated with that mechanism. Serious head injury in children, unfortunately, is a very uncommon event, but potentially the consequences may be devastating if a serious head injury is missed, a serious brain injury is missed because of, of um, failure to recognise risk factors or for delayed presentation. And what we're increasingly become aware of is that there are some harms associated with the investigations in children, particularly imaging the young developing brain and a recognition of the radiation dose and associated increased risk of brain tumours and leukaemia in young children, particularly for those children under the age of two years. How do we actually balance the risk of mi missing a significant brain injury and, and what's the best practice in terms of making a decision to observe or represent later if there are developing a development of symptoms later on? And we're increasingly as paediatricians and emergency physicians becoming aware of the risk of poor concussion management. So much has been focused on the sharp edge of acute brain, uh, acute head injury when we see a patient when they present in the emergency department, have their four hours of observation and are sent home. And less has been focused on the long-term consequences of concussion, particularly in um, high school age um, students, young, young adults, and how that might impact on their learning and their further involvement in sport because of the risk of concussion. So all those factors actually have a huge impact in the decision on a case-by-case -case basis of how best to actually manage a child with a head injury. There are resources that we can actually use when we're trying to inform parents when we're talking to them about CT scanning, but realistically, it's quite difficult to be able to take information such as one extra case of cancer estimated for every 1,800 CT scans about 10 years after exposure. What that actually means when we're talking to a parent about the balance of the risk of radiation from a CT versus the risk of missing a significant brain injury. And we need to be able to have a more comprehensive process to help in that decision making process. There are always going to be stories that rattle everyone whenever you are looking after children with brain injury and certainly children with some more, more severe brain injury, which is the exception for, you know, the majority of children who present will be mild to moderate. So a, the story of a presentation of a head injury may be a fairly trivial story. It may be the child fell off the bed, but sometimes it may be a, that presentation, which is actually associated with a more severe inflicted head injury in a child and how we actually stratify the risks and approach to that situation when the story at presentation might seem like a relatively minor um, mechanism of injury. And then there will always be the, the parents' worst nightmare stories of the child who had a relatively minor mechanism of injury, but um, unfortunately, because of the circumstances of how the child actually fell, um, ended up with significant brain injury. So this was a story very recently on the ABC News um, website that I looked at. I'm just going to read some of the story because some of the the um, uh, the vignette is really um, telling in terms of how we actually um, make decisions about children that should actually present to the emergency department. 
So the background story for this little girl, she was jumping off a stool, it was half a metre in height and slipped and fell down and hit the side of her head on a hard floor. She got up and seemed okay and then the parents after a vomit thought that she looked a bit unwell so took her to the emergency department. So after she presented to the emergency department the triage nurse said is she normally like this? At that moment her head flopped forward and the nurse snatched Mina from her father's arms and ran yelling recess. Suddenly there was more than a dozen people in gowns ripping off her clothes and connecting her to machines. My adrenaline started pumping and I had a gut-wrenching feeling of helplessness. My husband sat in the chair beside me, tears streaming down his face. Mina had suffered what's called an extradural hemorrhage. When the side of her head hit the floor, the impact ruptured an artery. After a few hours, a large collection of blood shifted her brain, causing her to lose consciousness. One of the surgeons said that such a serious head injury was more typical in a car accident or football injury, rarely in a fall from such a low height. There was no time for consent forms or discussions with doctors. Mina was taken straight for a CT scan and into surgery. Had we put her to bed that night, she never would have woken up. That's a chilling story, every parent's worst nightmare. But there are some things in that story that identify important factors in decision making. So there's a mention of um, mechanisms of injury and more severe mechanisms of injury car accidents or football injuries are more typically associated with more severe injury as opposed to falls from a low height. But really what the story is telling of a child that initially seemed okay and then had a deterioration quite quickly in her level of consciousness and responsiveness, which indicated a, a, an accumulation of her blood that was compromising her brain. And that change initially in behaviour and then progression of her neurological status are really key things when we're looking at making decisions around when children need to be seen in the hospital setting as well as how they should be managed when they are seen in that setting. Con con in contrast to that story of Mina and her severe brain injury, there is a lack of parental recognition certainly from my personal experience of parents, parents' understanding of concussion in children, which is far more common um, in the context of presentations to the emergency department than an epidural um, hemorrhage is. And concussion, while often the um, initial um, assessment might focus on this as being a mild head injury and not to the head when a, a um, child was going up um, to catch a ball might actually have more significant impact on a child post discharge from hospital and be far more common and is something that we need to be more aware of. Unfortunately, even as experts, there's often a lack of information about what is best practice for concussion management. And when we look at the literature to review to develop evidence-based guidelines, the focus is very much on sports-related concussion and tends to focus on older children, adolescents and young adults who are playing competitive sport. And that's where the majority of the evidence on concussion is relevant to the paediatric age population. There's very little evidence about concussion in young children and how best we should actually manage that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about clinical decision rules and the reason why this is an important thing to recognise is they have actually informed clinical practice, certainly within the hospital setting for at least the last 15 years. And there's been three major studies that have been published specifically addressing clinical decision rules to guide management for paediatric head injury. So the Chalice study was done in the UK and published in 2006 and was really looking at on the basis of um, factors for history, examination and mechanism when a CT scan should be done. This was then followed in 2018 by a Canadian study, the CATCH rule that also looked at um, indications for CT scanning, but was a more simplified list of it. In the original catch um, was only seven items that were um, included in the assessment of risk factors. The most recent paediatric head injury decision rule was the PCAN rule. So PCAN is the 
emergency, pediatric emergency network in the United States, pediatric emergency uh, care applied research network. And this was a huge study that was published in the Lancet in 2009 by Nate Cooperman's group. And in the cohort, there were 40, more than 42,000 children that were in the original derivation study and then validation of their decision rules. It's important to note in this study, their CT scanning rate was 35%, which is significantly higher than is usual practice in the Australian setting. But even in that, the incidence of clinically important traumatic brain injury was still very low. So less than 1% of the children in this study had a clinically important traumatic brain injury. And that is defined as injury that is requiring neurosurgical intervention or an admission to ICU. What is really important about this decision rule is that it actually separated risk factors on the basis of age and a recognition of the vulnerabilities of the very young child with head injury as compared to the older child. And what this did is help decision making focusing on those who were at very low risk of a um, clinically important um, brain injury for whom CT scan did not need to be done and where alternate approaches, including structured observation, was the recommendation. So these rules have come into clinical practice and they've been used in settings, uh, used now in apps such as MD Calc, which are bedside tools that a clinician can use to go through a simple sort of question and answer and at the end of it, calculate a risk of low, intermediate or high risk with a recommendation for clinical management. So this is the chalice rule. This is the first one I spoke to you about. One of the challenges that about the chalice rule has been that one of the features on history has been the three or more vomits after head injury as a, a risk factor independently that would make you more likely to be assessed as having intermediate or if there are other factors having high risk for which you would be recommended to have a CT scan. The chalice rule has a high sensitivity but its specificity is actually quite low and there, this is one of the challenges with clinical decision rules. So the catch rule, the Canadian rule, as I said, is simpler. It only has seven items. And when you use the app on MD Calc to use the catch rule, it will essentially take you through um, when to actually use the decision rule and then um, give you an estimate of risk on the basis of how you've actually answered the tool. And this compares to the PCAN algorithm, algorithm, which using the same tool on MD Calc as an app would have a separate algorithm for the less than two years versus the greater than two years. So if you answered for this child less than two years that they had no features of a palpable skull fracture, had a GCS that was more than was 15 and had no evidence of a hematoma, loss of consciousness and was acting normally, then certainly the recommendation would be that a CT would not be required and the risk of clinically important brain injury was very, very low. So that's how these decision rules have come into clinical practice, certainly within the emergency department setting. What we have identified is when we actually compare these rules head to head and actually look at what physician practice is when they um, make decisions independently of these decision rules, that the sensitivity, uh, particularly of the PCAM rule, is very good, but the specificity is still low. So because of that, most of the children who are going to have a CT scan won't have a brain injury, which is intrinsic to the fact that you need that to have a tool that's sensitive. But what you're then doing is exposing children's brains who do not have a brain injury and potentially in, um, putting them at risk of long-term complications. What some studies have showed, and this is a study by Easter's group that compared decision rules as well as clinical practice that showed 
physician practice was actually pretty good and that senior clinician judgment was almost as sensitive as decision rules, particularly when it came, came to using planned observation as an alternative to actually doing a CT scan. So the role of actually observing over a period of time and going back and reassessing rather than making a decision to scan or not scan at a single point. As good as the decision rules are in terms of sensitivity, they do have some issues that they don't address all the clinical scenarios that we have that, that present either to general practice or to the emergency department. They don't really tell us what to do if the knock to the head was yesterday morning and we're now seeing them in the following evening because all these decision rules have been validated for within 24 hours of presentation. So if the child still has a headache now and they had a knock on the head yesterday morning, what does that actually mean in terms of my decision making around their symptoms? And they don't actually tell us what to do when a child is at increased risk of intracranial bleeding because of a bleeding disorder. They don't tell us what to do when there's a child who has a baseline um, atypical neurological presentation because of an underlying diagnosis such as autism and how we actually risk stratify for them. And they certainly don't tell us what to do when we see an intoxicated young person who's fallen down and hit their head. So there is some difficulties when we're dealing with a situation that isn't as simple. And the other thing that's really important to understand is that when we uniformly apply clinical decision rules, looking at all those factors, keying them into apps or looking at guidelines, is that if we actually apply them across the Australian setting, we would actually increase our CT rate because we know that our baseline CT rates across even tertiary, metro and regional settings are actually significantly lower than, than North America. This study that was published in 2020 by the PREDICT group looked at CT rates for head injury in children in three different settings. So large children's emergency department, large mixed emergency departments in metro settings, as well as regional settings. And the CT rates really didn't significantly vary regardless of where the child presented. And nor did the outcomes, which is the important thing. So there was an expectation that if a child presents in a country area because you don't have a neurosurgeon available, you might be more likely to get a CT scan, but that's not proven to be the case. So PREDICT's area, um, work in this area has really evolved from initially being focused on trying to find the best clinical decision rule to really an understanding that we needed a more comprehensive head injury guideline that's going to apply across our settings. So PREDICT is an international group in that it involves in Australia and New Zealand. Um, so that was the basis of looking at how care for children in Australian and New Zealand emergency departments is influenced by the, the known clinical decision rules and what is actually important in terms of understanding sometimes there aren't evidence based and we need some recommendations, particularly where you've got expert consensus. So this led to the development of the working group with, an under, with contribution from members across the setting in which children are seen in emergency departments. Even from my background as a paediatric emergency specialist from a large children's hospital, we recognise that the majority of children that present to hospital are seen in metropolitan, regional and rural hospitals. That's where the majority of children with head injuries are actually seen. So if we want to actually have a guideline that's going to be useful nationally, it needs to be applicable to all the settings in which children have been seen. This guideline was not developed specifically for the general practice setting, but it was recognised that children with head injuries do present to the general practice setting and there needed to be some engagement with general practice so that there was an understanding about which type of patients were appropriate to be seen in general practice and which patients should actually be referred on to the acute hospital setting. And obviously in rural areas where the, um, the GP VMOs may well be seeing a patient in the context of the emergency department setting, it was important to have a guideline that would help inform their practice as well.
So the guideline group for which I was part of consisted of representation across the spectrum of paediatric emergency medical and nursing, general paediatricians such as myself, neurosurgery, intensive care, pre-hospital medicine um, with, with representation from paramedics, as well as radiologists to help us in regards to um, informed advice around uh, CT imaging, general practice, and most importantly, implementation scientists that it could actually help us with a rigorous way of actually assessing in a, a methodological way the body of evidence that um, would help us make decisions for um, children around presentation with head injury. So this work took us um, two years and in a way COVID would, and the progress over 2020 was a blessing for many of us who work in paediatric emergency medicine because there was less clinical presentations to paediatric emergency medicine. So it gave us an opportunity to be able to progress this quicker than we had thought we were able to do. The overall structure comes down to this algorithm, although behind it stands a comprehensive um, summary as well as a further document that is very weighty that looks at the evidence in a very rigorous way. The, the um, methodology that was used is something called a dolpment. Now a dolpment is a way of actually getting the existing guidelines that have been known to be used and looking at their recommendations to see what their evidence base is, seeing if things need to be adapted because of new evidence or whether or not they were still appropriate and could be adopted or whether or not new recommendations needed to be made. And as a consequence, 33 clinical questions around assessment and management of head injury were developed and then out of that, there were 71 recommendations in the guideline, of which there's a mix of evidence-based consensus and practice points. So it's a very comprehensive, very up-to-date, um, taking into consideration the international evidence and the guidelines that have existed before this. So the first part is really that, that factor of look, though, that um, step of assessing for risk factors. When a child presents to the emergency department with a GCS of 13 or less, then on this algorithm, they are essentially should be assessed by a senior clinician and it's and progressed onto head CT scan as the, the recommendation for a child who is at much higher risk of in, intracranial injury. And for those children who are assessed with an appropriate paediatric Glasgow Coma Scale of GCS of 14 or 15, the next step is to look at risk factors for intracranial injury. And those risk factors are based on the PECAN um, factors between the age of less than two years or greater than two years, because there are different risk factors for those groups, but also recognising for all children that if their GCS is 14 or there are other signs of altered mental status, as well as a severe mechanism of injury, then those are uh, risk factors that would make it more likely that you would have a clinically important traumatic brain injury and have CT scan. So the, the first step is really getting a very comprehensive history about mechanism and the evolution of the child's symptoms at the time they actually present to the emergency department. The back page of the algorithm is really informing the detailed stuff, the extra things that help you interpret the algorithm as well as those special conditions that I talked about before that require some different approach to assess risk in those. And I'll come back to this later. So the first bit is really which patient should be assessed in the hospital setting. So it's really about triage and these patients may be seen on the side of a netball court um, and an ambulance called or they may present to a general practice um, with, uh, within a short period of time from the initial head injury or the parents may present directly to an, a, an emergency department. So the re recommendations for triaging are consensus-based. There really wasn't 
a good evidence base for the most sensitive tool for triaging children with head injury to actually uh, recommend as the best um, method of triaging for um, which children should go to hospital or not. But the consensus of the expert panel was that presence of any of these symptoms within 72 hours of the injury should prompt assessment in the hospital setting. So seizure, double vision, ataxia, clumsiness, loss of consciousness of any duration, deteriorating level of consciousness, weakness, tingling in arms and legs, presumed skull fracture. So that means an obvious step in the bone or signs of a base of skull fracture, such as raccoon eyes, so the dark circles under the eyes, or battle sign, which is bleeding over the mastoid process from a base of skull fracture. And that may, um, be, may be present later, so the child might have fallen over yesterday and then 24 to 48 hours later may have development of those signs that weren't apparent initially. Vomiting is an important one and there's a recognition that isolated vomiting by itself as a single symptom without any other alteration in neurological status is very unlikely to be indicative of clinically important traumatic brain injury. Severe headache, change in behaviour such as drowsiness and agitation and presence of occipital, parietal or temporal scalp hematoma. So children in toddlers, we're, we're very familiar with them bumping into things all the time and very often they will have a frontal hematoma where they've got a br bit of bruise from knocking things. So a simple abrasion, simple um, frontal hematoma with a child that's otherwise well should not prompt a need to be assessed in a hospital setting. So severe mechanism injury, regardless of the child's neurological status, is a risk factor for injury, but it needs to be taken in the context of the, the rest of the child's presentation and certainly should warrant at least investigation or if not imaging if there are presence of other risk factors. This is in contrast to the child with a trivial head injury which is recognised as ground level falls, such, such as a toddler who trips and falls forward, gets up, cries, runs and is fine. Walking or running into stationary objects, no loss of consciousness, GCS of 15, and no signs or symptoms of head trauma other than abrasion. So those, those are considered trivial head injuries and may be appropriately assessed and do not need to be referred to hospital for assessment. So the mechanism of injury then needs to be considered within the context of the clinical presentation. And these are the risk factors I pointed out before that were from the PECAN study that was published. And they're really recognising that there are other things that we look for in children less than two years that may indicate an underlying brain injury that we're less likely to see in older children. So History of vomiting you can see is present as a risk factor for older children, but it's less likely to be a risk factor in younger children. So going through the process of looking at those risk factors for the presence or absence of those is important. So the in the corner from, from the algorithm is really, is really addressing at the point of presentation, does the child have any special conditions that would warrant a higher degree of um, risk assessment um, for that child, regardless of um, the presence of other risk factors. So as I said, it's kind of on the back page, but it's kind of your guide to interpret what this actually means. So we know in children under the age of six months, they're at high risk. So those even under the in the under two year group, there will also be those who are much younger who we need to have a lower threshold for observational imaging. Children with neurosurgery who've had shunts 
children with bleeding disorder. So there's specific guidance in those special circumstances as to what the recommendation would be for immediate management and then advice around need for CT regardless of presence of risk factors or not, such as a child on warfarin or a child um, who has a known coagulation disorder where the recommendation would be to treat the coagulation disorder primarily before considering um, if the child needs a CT. So working through the algorithm takes into account all those additional factors that need to be considered when you're making a decision about should this child be referred to hospital or not, and what is different in the way we're actually going to manage them compared to a child without those conditions. So the decision rules for CT scanning generally fall into categories about whether evidence would suggest that if you the number and severity and persistence of the signs and symptoms should really inform whether or not you choose between a structured observation and a head CT scan. So I'll go back to the example of vomiting. So vomiting after head injury is common, particularly in young children, if they present with three vomits in a short period of time, but no other risk factors and no symptoms settle down then the choice favours making a structured observation rather than a head CT scan. But if that vomiting persists or there are development of other signs, then the choice would favour doing a head CT scan. So a CT scan should then, in contrast to that, not be performed if there's no risk factors, if the child is actually presented with a normal GCS um, of 15 and um, is seen certainly within the first 24 hours. There's really good evidence to inform that if they have no risk factors um, and they have a normal neurological examination, that the likelihood of a clinically important traumatic brain injury is extremely low and does not warrant a head CT scan. And the final recommendation is about those children who present with a delayed presentation and if their GCS is 13 or less, then and they present within 72 hours, then there is evidence that they should be treated in the same way as a child who presents in the first 24 hours, and they should actually have a CT scan because they have, they have declared themselves as having persistent neurological abnormality. So the emphasis now that we're looking at reducing our CT rate is to actually do better structured observation rather than just stick a child in a corner and do a couple of set of OBS and say, look right and go home. It's really about specifying what structured observation means. So when a child is being referred up to the emergency department, we need to know the time of injury to be able to make a decision about how long we're actually going to keep them in the hospital setting before we feel that it's appropriate for them to actually be discharged home. So at time of presentation, they should have at least have half hourly OBS for the first two hours and then hourly until they're at least four hours post injury. And if they continue to remain in the hospital for observation, we would continue then second hourly observations but the child needs to have normal observations for at least an hour, regardless from the time of injury, before they're suitable to be discharged. And obviously the number and the duration of observations may be varied depending on the patient and how, you know, what time it is since the child's actually presented from injury. But giving specific instructions around how long that observation should be and when it's appropriate to make a discharge the child if a decision is made not to do a head CT scan. So how does that apply across the general practice setting? It's really important that the understanding for who is appropriate, who you should be sending to hospital and which children you could be safely managed at home, such as those children with a trivial, trivial head injury. It's also important for you to understand why a decision may be made when a child is seen in the emergency department, why a CT scan was done or why a CT scan wasn't done and why a decision was made about observation before the child was actually discharged home. And the other aspect is when a child is discharged home, they need to be actually given advice from the emergency department when they actually represent. And generally that would be back to the emergency department. If a child is is discharged from the emergency department, 
and has a change in their neurological status or evolution of their symptoms, they should represent to emergency rather than to go to general practice. And the, the management of concussion is something that they should be given advice on from the emergency department with plans that they will require follow-up before further decisions about returning to school and returning sport can actually be made. So, and the algorithm is all very nice. It's a nice, pretty colourful picture, but it's most helpful when we understand through case vignettes how it actually applies and helps us inform decision making. So there's a website called Don't Forget the Bubbles, and Don't Forget the Bubbles is a, a website that was founded by a group of paediatric emergency physicians, and it's a fantastic resource. It basically um, provides information that's um, in a very usable format um, across um, any acute paediatric problem and it covers simple basic things such as what normal baby poos look, look like after they're born to more challenging situations in sort of the acute critical care aspect of paediatric care. Following the publication of the PREDICT guideline, the Don't Forget the Bubbles website um, published this on their website, which is basically taking the steps through the algorithm. And what I really like about the, what they've done is that they essentially have little vignettes of presentations that help guide you through the, the patient story of a presentation and the decision points about whether or not a child might require a CT scan. So it's really putting the algorithm through its paces when you're looking at clinical presentations. So the, the you know, often um, uh, very common presentation of a toddler with vomiting after a head injury. So this little um, case vignette kind of takes you through as the child vomits and has a a uh, few further vomits and then it presents to the emergency department and then takes you through the steps in the algorithm to actually inform decisions about observation and appropriate discharge. Another case vignette is a, an adolescent or so an older child who has an immediate post in head injury seizure um, and her management after the head injury. So. It's, um, I'd certainly highly recommend it if you're trying to actually understand how to actually apply the algorithm to real life cases. And there's about 14 cases in total um, that really kind of illustrate how useful the algorithm is when you're trying to make a decision about what you should do with the child in front of you. So this is an example of a very young child. So in this case, a two month old child. Um, and uh, we know from the special conditions that a child under the age of six months, um, we need to be more cautious around decisions for um, observation or head, inju head injury as an additional risk factor. And then the more typical presentation of an infant with a hematoma who's been knocked back. So, I won't go into each of the circumstances, but it's really an excellent way of demonstrating how to actually apply an algorithm in real clinical cases to help work through what is going to be the, um, the recommended approach using the algorithm. So this is a, another illustration of a, a case where, which might be applicable to a very common setting where a child has had a head injury, um, on the playing field, um, felt a little bit unwell, but then was taken home and had a headache and then presented um, to the general practice the next day with persistence of headache. And this really then focuses on the aftermath of mild head, head, head injury, which is really about concussion management. So after discharge from um, the emergency department, once a decision is made that the child either has a negative head CT scan because it was indicated or the child had structured observation or there was no risk factors for, it, for the requirement for any of those that um, they can be discharged from the emergency department. Those children do not need to have a specific follow-up plan because they have been assessed and they're risk of clinically important brain injury is very low and although the parents will be given advice for when to represent, specific follow-up will not be recommended for those children. 
However, what is important for parents to be able to understand and recognise when there are symptoms and signs of concussion and to be on the alert for possibility of persistent or delayed post-concussive symptoms. So trying to predict those children most likely to have post-concussion after a head injury has been challenging. This was a study that was published in Canada looking at presentations in children aged between 5 and 18 who were seen within the first 48 hours of head injury. And most, the majority of these children were seen in the acute period of time after their head injury. What this study looked at was trying to predict which children were most, most likely on follow-up to have persistent symptoms. And it demonstrated what has previously been recognised in the literature that older children, so that teenagers and particularly females, were much more likely to have persistent post-concussive symptoms. If there's associated history of migraine, um, then that also increases your likelihood of having post-concussive symptoms. And then a simple um, clinical assessment, including tandem gait um, and cognition, can also um, predict whether or not you're more likely to have post-concussion symptoms. So as a consequence, those things need to be flagged to identify that a child might require specific concussion follow-up after a head injury. Making decisions around who should do the follow-up is very much dependent on your local setting as to which children um, from the emergency department should be followed up in general practice or should come up to be seen in outpatients or in the children's hospitals a specific concussion follow-up clinic. So the understanding of the recovery stages of concussion and that in the initial stages the focus is on rest to enable best recovery so that a child may re return to um, schooling and sport um, and, full, and certainly for these older children to return to game play is really what's important in making those follow-up plans when a child goes home from the emergency department. So as part of the discharge process, there should be recommendations for the initial period of time that the child has physical rest for no longer than 48 hours, that there should be normal daily activities such as reading or gentle walking, and then a graded return first to school activities, um, doing some learning at home and then returning to school for partial attendance before returning to full-time attendance. And certainly in my setting, I would, you know, engage with the family and see if they wish to attend the general practice for assessment so that a decision can be made to assess persistent symptoms before a child actually returns to full-time schooling. And most schools would want some sort of medical certificate for a child returning from a head injury, particularly if the recommendation is for partial attendance. And likewise, there needs to be a graded return to sport. So the first priority is return to school for these young people, and then return a graded return to initially light exercise and then for the sports um, related concussion specifically to return to increasing their level of activity and doing non-contact drills before returning to training and then to full competitive sport. And the thing that I think is really important to stress to parents, particularly for young people who think just sitting at home in bed doing nothing is boring, particularly if I'm going to limit their screen time, is that they need to allow their brain to recover. So the neurons have been injured in concussion and that we need to conserve energy resources so that the neurons can recover. Schoolwork, game playing, physical activity, drains that energy that is important for repair and that we need to approach it in a stepwise manner, otherwise the symptoms are going to persist longer. So the other thing that I want to mention that may be asked to present to general practice for, present, uh, for um, assessment is young children who've had a simple linear skull fracture. So this may be identified because the child has clinical evidence of a fracture, but a normal neurological examination 
or may have required CT um, examination because they had a significant scalp hematoma. And on the CT scan, a simple linear skull fracture is identified. If the child is otherwise neurologically well, then these children will certainly be managed without any neurosurgical intervention. But the, it is important that, particularly in young children, that they do have some follow-up. There's a very rare complication from simple linear skull fractures in children called a growing skull fracture or a leptomeningeal cyst. And this occurs essentially where there's diastasis along the fracture line, where there's herniation of the dura through the fracture, and this can be associated with underlying um, encephalomalacia of the brain below um, as it's um, being forced to herniate through that area of the skull. It is a very rare complication, but it can be detected clinically quite early within a month or two of the injury. And it's really just a matter of clinically examining the child to see if there's a persistent swelling at the fracture site to then refer back for um, neuros neurosurgical assessment. So that certainly can be done within the general practice setting and then flagged if there's any concerns. But a child with a simple linear skull fracture should have some follow-up to ensure that the fracture is healed and there's no persistent swelling at the fracture site. So that is a lot of information, but I um, am gonna hand back to Michelle to see how she goes in terms of facilitating questions, um, which I'm happy to take at this point. Thank you very much, Liz. That was um, a really informative um, presentation and great to see what the clinical evidence is behind um, the new guidelines that um, you and your team have been developing. Um, look, if anyone wants to ask a question, please put it in the, the question box and we'll endeavour to ask them all um, or answer them all. First one, Liz, is can you point us to a good resource to refer to when planning return to sport and school after concussion with with families? Um, yeah, so in my last bit, um, there's um, some resources that I will point you to. So the um, Sydney Children's Hospital Networks on their kids' health pages has um, documents for concussion plans and they also have um, plans for return to school and re return to sport. So they're the ones that I certainly use at the moment. Um, PREDICT is also very keen um, because they've done a lot of work in this area, having a, um, a resource that can be um, generic and applied that isn't specific to any of the children's hospitals. And so we're certainly working on consolidating the best of what's out there. Um, but this on the Sydney Children's Hospital Network on the information pages um, has resources for clinicians to use for action planning for children of different ages, as well as return to school and return to sport. Um, there are also resources from um, uh, a, a, um, sporting, specific sporting bodies as well that give some guidance about return um, to training um, that's relevant to their individual sport as well. So you've got that link on your slides, have you? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Great. Thanks. So um, everyone, those slides will be made available on the PHN's website under the, um, the People Bank, I believe. But Jenny can correct me if, if I'm wrong with that. Um, next question is, at what time would you follow up the simple linear skull fracture? Um, yeah, that is the difficult question because I haven't, in the literature, there is... Um, not a lot of information about the ideal time. And whenever I specifically ask the neurosurgeons, because they always say, I'll oh, make sure it gets followed up, you know, so that it's healed whenever I've had a child with a simple linear skull fracture. The, um, certainly, I wouldn't um, see them too early. I wouldn't necessarily see them within a couple of weeks, because there's certainly going to be persistent swelling from a hematoma from an acute fracture. My practice has been to see them at at least two months after and if there's any concerns for the follow-up uh, at that time. But if the skull is looking completely, the scalp is looking completely normal two months um, after the injury and, you know, everything else suggests healing, then I think that you're fine. But in terms of 
um, how informed that decision is. It seems to be sort of, um, you know, expert and individual practice rather than evidence-based because most of the studies that publish in this area, because it is a very rare complication, generally include cohorts retrospectively and they're often seeing presentations up to a year post head injury, but clearly those um, you know, are later presentations. But my clinical practice has been, if they're not going to see the GP for follow-up, I'll make sure someone has seen them within two months of the injury to look for signs of the swelling going down and evidence that there is no bony um, defect where the um, fracture site was. Do you re-image them at that time or no. just a clinical no. assessment? A clinical assessment. So if there is evidence of some persistent swelling or feels like there's a gap in the bone, then the ideal imaging is actually an MRI because you actually need to be able to see the, um, the dura distinctly to see where it's actually sitting within the fracture line. So, and doing an MRI in a small person is not easy. So I would refer for consultation. I would not organise a CT scan. I would get specialist opinion before imaging if there's any question about persistent swelling at the fracture site. Okay, thank you. Well, that's a, a segue into the next question, which is, is there any role for MRI post head injury? Um, we looked at this in our, our um, evidence base and there have been some more um, some small studies done in children for what's called rapid MRI. I don't quite know what sort of machines they have, but they could do a rapid sequence of MRI. This is really only study it been in in small studies. Um, and the, the evidence that it actually is any better for an acute brain injury um, for recognition of um, something that would require neurosurgical intervention um, is not there. It certainly has the benefit that it's not radiation, but practically the accessibility for the number of children that would need to have an MRI in preference to a CT scan um, for most clinical settings across Australia and New Zealand does, you know, is really not um, a, a feasible option. And the evidence that it is actually any better um, in the acute setting for differentiating um, with less radiation is certainly not there. So, um, yeah, there's just no evidence that it's better um, to overcome the benefits of less radiation. Hmm. All right, thanks, Liz. Just a question from me. Um, I'm interested that um, the surface on which a child falls doesn't play into the the algorithm there about determining whether um, an injury is uh, trivial or significant. I'm wondering if you could comment on that. Yeah, because most of it is on height, height of fall, rather than you know, is is a fall of a meter onto carpet. Um, better than a fall of a metre onto a hard lino floor and is that of itself an independent um, factor? Um, there is no evidence on that and I suppose there are um, uh, confounders because children who hit something hard versus something soft are more likely to have a hematoma at the site um, and it, it, it also depends on what part of the head actually hits the surface as well. So there aren't, um, other than height, pure height of fall, but there is no good evidence in the literature about the surface on which you fall. Okay, good to know. Yeah. Well, thanks, Liz. Look, there aren't any more questions um, in the chat. Um, but um, if people do want to uh, look up the guidelines, um, just Google Australia New Zealand Pediatric Head Injury Guidelines and it's the first hit on Google because I tried during Liz's talk. Um, and um, I'll just ask Jenny in just a sec just to confirm um, where Liz's slides will be made available and this talk has been recorded so it will also be made available on the PHN's website again. Uh, as well. Uh, but look, thank you again, Liz, um, for 
your presentation tonight um, and I think congratulations on what's been a considerable amount of work for you and your research team um, but it looks like it's a very useful and helpful um, guideline. Yeah and that was certainly the outcome that we wanted. We, we wanted something that was going to be sort of a bedside tool. We knew that it needed to have a very comprehensive um, approach in looking at the evidence and that that required a lot of um, uh, time considering what the questions were and how best to answer those questions and that's why the actual guideline document itself is so long but it is essentially the, the questions are primarily around who needs to be assessed and which is the, um, the best way of actually recognising um, important brain injury in children. Um, in, you know, this this is kind of the first of a body of work. A lot of what Predictor actually most interested in with guidelines is actually translation into clinical practice. So we needed to have the guideline out there, but what a lot of our work is now moving on to is actually looking at translation and how it affects practice change um, and applicable across many settings. So we've done that with the bronchiolitis guideline in terms of how we can change practice about reducing chest x-rays and use of subutamol and uh, treatment for which there is evidence of no benefit. So following on from this guideline being published, there will be a body of work about making it much more applicable to the clinician at the coalface and what tools that are actually going to be helpful to them in terms of providing information to parents, um, having resources to guide concussion management, um, letters that you can use for, for schools to communicate with schools. So those will follow on from this and, and it's really the consumer end that we're now focusing on. As I said, I, for anybody who really wants to get a better understanding how to apply the algorithm, the Don't Forget the Bubbles um, website on this has, has really kind of, you know, captured the key elements of very typical dilemmas in decision making for head injury. But there will, following on from this, this guideline will then be adapted by all of the children's hospitals across Australia and then will kind of filter down to um, most hospital settings as, as being recognised as kind of the most up-to-date evidence-based guideline for head injury in children. Well, that sounds great. I think we'll look forward to all those resources because uh, they sound like they'd be really helpful for yeah, GPs at the coalface. Yeah, um, so th thanks, Liz. And thanks, everybody, for your attendance. Um, Jenny, is there any final sort of things that we need to do to sign off? Uh, no, that's Fine. Thank you, ladies, so much uh, for your time tonight. Um, I will send everybody the link so that um, to our website where our resource library is, and um, it'll probably take about 24 hours, but we'll have um, a copy of the presentation and the slides. So thank you so much, everyone, um, and I'll catch you next time. Great. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks, both.